Hey guys how are you all? Welcome back to my channel. Today we will see what if Naruto outsmarts Konoha. If you enjoy then please like share and do comments. Naruto simply stared at the dumbest villagers he had seen in his entire life. Seriously. Four years of being called a demon and a monster without doing anything to prove them right was causing his young mind to think that maybe they were the real monsters in this ill-begotten country. It could be said that in the short four years of his life, he had been forced to grow up rather fast, and as of late, he was beginning to notice that the villagers' misplaced hate was starting to really grate on his nerves. He had seen other kids with their parents of course. Hell, strangers didn't even treat themselves like he was being treated. What would he have to do to just get them to back off and leave him the hell alone? His golden blonde hair waved as he stood contemplating this latest setback in his mission to prove the villagers wrong. Why am I trying to do this again? In front of him stood two villagers, their beer bellies sticking slightly out of their bulging jumpers as they glared at him with grossly misshaped, bloodshot eyes. Ya damn monster. Wha, the heck ya think ya trying to pull coming into our shop like that? The one on the right raged as he waved his beer bottle in the air manically. Ya ain't got no right to step ya filthy feet past the doorway, here? The man's belly wobbled, his puckered fat lips foaming as he bellowed in anger at the youngster. Naruto almost cracked up there and then at the sheer absurdity of the situation. Almost, the second villager, a rotund, greasy brown-haired man stood to the left of his companion glaring with an almost frigid gaze. However, it was his words that were the catalyst to a world-changing decision that would haunt Konoha for years to come. It could be said, that as he had a more sober mind and was able to communicate in more than a drunkard's slur, his words carried far more weight than that of his maniac of a counterpart. You, who have killed so many of our friends and family, have no right to enter any of the shops and buildings anywhere within Konoha. You should be dead. Spitting the last statement from his mouth, he turned and stomped away, leaving his companion to finish up with the innocent youth. What the hell does that mean, you fat geezer? I haven't killed anyone. You people are the ones that always hurt me. It was safe to say that Naruto was close to his breaking point. After everything he had been through in his life, this guy had the audacity to say that he, four and a quarter years old Uzumaki Naruto, was responsible for people dying? He had never lifted a finger to an animal let alone a human. Don't go playing dumb ya stupid demon. We all know just wa, ya capab, capably, capable of. Throwing his empty bottle at Naruto, he turned to follow after his companion, probably to return to more rounds of alcohol and drunkenness. Naruto was livid, capable, him, he wasn't anywhere near what one could call capable. Why, if he was so capable, could he not push the swing by himself while he sat on it? Why, if he was so capable, could he not cook any of the delicious food he had seen being made in all those top class restaurants? Why, if he was so capable, could he not protect himself when the villagers attacked him for no reason? The brown bottle that the man had thrown, bounced off his head with a dull, thud, and Naruto was left with an incessant ringing in his ears and cloudy vision for the next five minutes. Even as he stood there, staring at the ground, his small face scrunched up with tears leaking from the corner of his eyes, he knew that these people didn't deserve protection, they didn't deserve his trust. The words of the quiet drunk resounded in his head over and over. You should be dead, he couldn't take it anymore. His small brain was almost exploding with confusion, hurt and anger. The image of his lonely form sitting on a swing in one of Konoha's small parks kept appearing in his mind. How many times had he wished that there would be someone there to push him, to let him experience the rushing wind, as he swung, whooping and screaming at the top of his lungs? How many times had he wondered that if nobody would push him, maybe a strong enough breeze would force his small body into the air instead? He had witnessed the ones his Gigi called ninja springing from the rooftops at high speed and he wondered what it would be like to have to rely on no one. Slowly, he came to, the ringing in his ears subsiding and the fog over his vision dispersing. He realized he was still standing at the side of the curb in one of Konoha's busier market districts. The sun had begun to set and many of the shopkeepers were packing up, readying themselves to go home, again something he wished he had. He knew there was no point returning to the orphanage, they would kick him out again anyway. No, he'd sleep outside today. Besides, he had his monthly meeting with the Hokage tomorrow and he wanted to ask his Gigi all the questions that were assaulting his mind. 
Raising his head, he watched as the sun disappeared over the top of a building before turning to trudge towards the forest. At least the idiot villagers couldn't catch him there. And with the setting of the sun, so did the dream to be Hokage diminish from his small mind. The sun would rise again, but his dream was irrevocably changed. He couldn't remember when he had first started thinking of being free from his cage. Free, like the sun. Sarutobi Hirazan stared. If he was asked he would openly admit that right now he was more surprised than he had been in a very long time. In fact, the last time he had been this surprised was when Minato-kun had stated that he would have to take over as Hokage again, as the genius Shinobi was about to die. Of course, that time he was more worried about the Kayubi than he was about being Hokage and so couldn't really concentrate on why he was so shocked. But this time there were no convenient distractions. Naruto had just asked to be a ninja yet not a ninja. He just asked to learn shinobi techniques yet he didn't want to join the academy or become a Konoha shinobi. Why, Naruto? Why wouldn't you want to become a Konoha shinobi at the same time? You would be paid, and you would be able to look after yourself. Sarutobi really did not know what to make of this strange request. Obviously something had happened yesterday. The venerable ninja could easily decipher from Naruto's dejected look that something had caused him to change his dream of being Hokage. Gigi, I don't want to protect this village anymore. I like you and Ichiraku Jisan, but apart from that everyone's mean to me. I don't want to protect people who treat me so bad. Obviously the boy was not being forthcoming on the finer details, Sarutobi mused. Sighing, he stood up from his desk, where the mountain of the morning's paperwork teetered dangerously over the edge. He thought about Naruto's request. He supposed he could start the boy on the basics of chakra if he really wanted it. God knows, the kid deserved to have ninja training more than anyone else, given his heritage and the life he had led so far. But to not want to be allied with the village? He didn't think anything like that had been done before. If I do teach you to be a shinobi, what will you do with the skills? If not to protect people, how would you put the knowledge to good use? Naruto's face scrunched up in concentration. It took him a good 30 seconds for his four-year-old mind to grasp what the old Hokage meant, but when he did his face lit up. Sarutobi's heart lifted just by seeing the boy this happy after how down he had been just a minute before. Well ya see Gigi, I was thinking, see? And I thought if I could do all these cool tricks like jumping over buildings and running as fast as the wind then I could have loads of fun. Naruto was literally bouncing at this point in his excitement. He had obviously thought this through have fun? Naruto, ninja techniques are not for fun, they are used to protect people, to protect the will of fire that resides within all of the people in Konoha. You may think them fun now, but you will realize that these techniques can hurt people later on. Why would you want to hurt people if not to protect people from the ones that hurt them? Sarutobi didn't know if the boy would understand what he said, he was only four after all. Naruto's hair shadowed his eyes as he stared at his feet. When he raised his head, the Sandane Hokage was once again surprised with the calculating look that creased the youngster's face. Gigi, why should I protect people who are always trying to hurt me? You always say about the will of fire. Where's that fire when the people out there throw things at me? Where's that will of fire when no one wants to push me or play with me on the swings? Huh Gigi? Sarutobi paused. Well that explains what happened yesterday then. Damn those villagers, can't they see a little child for what it is? It struck him how Naruto's demands were not truly such a big thing. If anything it would help him as the Konoha council would not be able to overrule the Hokage if it was about civilian matters. The shinobi part of the council would not have a say and the civilian side would listen to anything their Hokage told them. No, if anything, this was a present for the Hokage. Danzo wouldn't be able to pressurize him any longer on having Naruto entered into the root program if he wasn't a shinobi. It was safe to say that guilt was eating away at the old Hokage's soul after Naruto's latest outburst. Also it couldn't hurt to teach the boy about some of the harmless things a shinobi learned. There were many civilians who had some training in the ninja arts, especially the students who didn't manage to graduate from the academy, or were taken from the roster due to debilitating injuries. All right. Naruto, I'll teach you some things, but if you get hurt or hurt other people then I am going to stop. Are we clear on that? Naruto's head whipped up from where it had fallen to staring at the floor again. His face split by a wide grin as he cheered. Woohoo, I'm gonna learn all these cool moves and have loads of fun all my life. 
Some of Saritobi's guilt disappeared when he heard that proclamation. At least he wouldn't regret this decision. Now listen closely Naruto, this is what ninja need to know. Naruto grinned devilishly. Oh, this was gonna be good. He had scoped out the Akamichi food house earlier and everything was prepared. If all went well, he'd be home free before 3 p.m. and no one would be any wiser. He almost let out a cacophony of evil laughter to suit the mood but instead settled for a quiet giggle. It wouldn't do for him to be caught, right? Over the last year or so, Naruto had been learning a few ninja techniques. He had managed to draw on his chakra and Gigi had taught him the leaf hovering control exercise. He hadn't fully mastered it yet, but he could move his chakra to most parts of his body. His feet, however, were still unable to hold chakra, but Gigi had said that it was the hardest point to focus chakra in the body. He had also managed a decent henge and could pull the kawarimi no jutsu off flawlessly. No matter how hard he tried though, he couldn't do the bunshin no jutsu. Ah well, practice makes perfect. And with that, he focused chakra to his legs and leapt off the building that he had been sitting on. It was close to noon and most of the Akamichi clan would be out at their favorite places of repast and so this was the best time for him to carry out his self-appointed mission. As he ran and jumped the small distances between the roofs of the Konoha buildings, he couldn't jump very far yet, so he had to settle for jumping to the nearest building each time. He pondered on why the Sandame wouldn't teach him any more than the three jutsu he had been practicing for the last year. Yeesh, the jutsu he gave me aren't very fun. Look at the amount of work I had to do to make them interesting. Truth be told, he was enjoying himself, but the true joy came after the deed, or so they say. Naruto was one to agree. Landing on the street floor once again, he quickly hid himself on the nearest house corner he could find. Usually the Akamichi were so focused on getting to their meals that they didn't pay any attention to their surroundings. No, the main problem was getting into the clan house. He would have to make sure that he wasn't caught then. Checking that the coast was clear, he ran as fast as his five-year-old legs could take him, through the hustle and bustle of one of Konoha's finer marketplaces. The sound of yelling and advertisement reached his ears as he pounded down the cobblestone street, keeping a wary eye out for anyone acting suspicious. He nearly snorted at that, if anyone was acting suspicious, it was him. As he cleared a large crowd of villagers who were waiting their turn at one of the more upstanding restaurants, he sighted the Akamichi clan house ahead. It was a modestly large building, nowhere near as big as say, the Uchiha or Hyuga estates, and was decked out in reds and browns. The mahogany and maroon doors stood large and imposing, with the Akamichi's trademark swirl painted smoothly on each side. No matter, he definitely was not going through the front. Stopping close to the front of the house, Naruto made his way down a side alley and spied exactly what he was looking for. There was a pile of delivery crates stacked almost as high as the first floor, very close to a window. Deftly scaling the boxes, he reached for the latch of the window, but his five-year-old body was not quite large enough to bridge the distance. Naruto leaned over and just as the pile was about to fall, sprang to the window ledge and unlatched the window. This was careless security, having a latch on the outside of a house, but then again the Akamichi thought they had nothing to hide. Oh how wrong they were. Just as Naruto found himself inside a sparsely furnished room, he encountered his first obstacle of his, sort of, mission. The crates had leaned too far over and had crashed to the ground. Ducking his head, he waited for the response of the villagers. What was that? He heard the pattering of running feet and then silence. Ah, the crates fell over. Must have been a cat. No matter, we'll inform Shuza as soon as he gets back. They may need them for a delivery later after all. Naruto listened intently as the voices moved away. He almost chuckled again. Little did they know that the crates were the least of their problems. He had to move quickly though, wouldn't want those idiotic villagers telling the fatsos before he was clear of this place. Padding over to the only door in the room, he cracked it open and peeked out. He was just outside some kind of hallway on the first floor, but he needed to get to the basement. Hopefully there wasn't anyone lounging around downstairs. Silently he moved out once again, this time keeping on his tiptoes and sticking close to the walls. He found the stairs at the end of the hallway and silently slipped down to the ground floor. Luckily for him, the stairs to the basement led directly off the ground floor, so he didn't hesitate. Reaching the ground floor, he shook with silent laughter as he looked upon his objective, the Akamichi Cutthroat Special. 
a recipe of great culinary importance that every Akamichi knew by heart. Standing on the dresser were several bowls of the delicacy just waiting to be eaten by any of the Akamichi who would be eating lunch at home today. Silently he crept over to the veritable stash and pulled out a black and crimson bottle of Mukha's legendary chili. Oh this was going to be good. Liberally emptying the contents into each bowl, he screwed the cap back on and made ready to leave. Just as he reached the top of the stairway of the first floor, he froze. He had been caught. Like a rabbit caught in headlights, he bolted for the same room he had come in from. The round-bellied Akamichi that stood in front of him, decked out in a sort of green samurai armor, bellowed and made to follow. Naruto slammed all his weight into the door, but was left dazed as the Akamichi scrambled up the stairs. Naruto, in his brief glance back, noticed a Konoha headband tied around the right bicep of the clinically obese ninja. Darn, at least a genin then, Naruto slammed his frame into the door another three times before the ringing in his head caused him to stop. The Akamichi almost upon him, he had an epiphany. The handle, turning the handle quickly, the door opened inwards and Naruto collapsed into the room, slamming the door shut after him. Haha fatty, you'll never catch me. Learn to climb over your belly before you try the stairs. He yelled at the door and then sprinted to the window. This time he had no inhibitions. Wrenching the latch open, he dived out, onto the fallen pile of delivery crates that splintered as he hit them, yet cushioned his fall. As he moved to stand up, he felt and heard the door to the first floor room explode, large chunks of the previously solid wooden entrance shooting out of the open window and impacting with the wall of the neighboring building. How dare you call me fatty? I'm not fat, I'm big boned you rat. When I get you I will pulverize you. Well that didn't sound too good to Naruto so he brushed himself off and made for the alleyway exit. Uh oh, that is not good. Having underestimated just how big the gap in skill a genin had over him, Naruto had expected the massive ninja to take a few more seconds to get out the window, but alas the Akamichi was faster than his expansive girth portrayed. He stood at the front of the alley with his limbs akimbo, which made for a frightening sight due to the imposing chubby belly hanging loosely from the front of the ninja's armor. If only he could regulate his chakra to his feet it would be far more effective than just bolstering his leg muscles. It was just typical that the genin knew the one skill that would give him the advantage in such a situation. As the adrenaline in his system roared through his veins, Naruto smiled. At least this guy wouldn't recognize him with the ridiculous getup he had on. He had ditched his white t-shirt and black pants for dark blue hose pants and a jet black sweatshirt. Wrapped around his head was a black scarf that hid his face up to his eyes and along with the open bandana he had covering his hair, he was sure that no one could recognize him as the blonde anathema that was Uzumaki Naruto. And anyway, he had the henge as his last resort, which he was planning on using, but right now he needed the other jutsu in his arsenal. The Akamichi Genin charged towards him cocking his fist back to punch the small blonde in the face. Unfortunately he smashed a delivery crate into pieces. He lunged again, only to get a wooden crate in the face. Again and again he attempted to get the black covered brat in any way he could and every time he hit another wooden crate. Finally, after his fists were severely abused and his face red with fury, he managed to get to within a meter of the small imposter. Taking the chance, he launched forward in a crude but devastating headbutt. Naruto smirked as he made the seal for the Kawarimi once again. Boy was this fun. The Akamichi slammed headfirst into an iron beam that had been buried under all the crates, but had been unearthed as Naruto constantly switched with them. The Akamichi stood for a full 20 seconds, comically lumbering from side to side as he strove to keep his consciousness. Finally he collapsed, out like a light. Naruto was panting hard, he had used most of his chakra reserves for that little stunt, but it had been worth it. He figured he had just enough chakra remaining for a solid henge, but first he had one more opportunity he just couldn't pass up. Leaning down to the collapsed ninja's face, he pulled a permanent marker from his small hip pouch. It was a standard issue the Hokage had given him to keep his money in. Quickly, he scribbled a word on each of the Akamichi's cheeks and then the same on the ninja's back. Cackling, he righted himself and made the seals for the henge no jutsu. Mission accomplished, now he just needed a place to watch the fireworks. All was normal in the busy market square outside the Grand Akamichi clan house. Passers-by stopped to admire the red and brown regalia that adorned every inch of the building, 
some openly expressing awe and admiration for the clan's tastes. The first sign that anything was wrong inside the building was a slight old rumbling accompanied by a high-pitched whining. As it grew steadily louder many of the villagers turned to see if they could catch a glimpse of what was making the noise. It seemed to come from the Akamichi clan house. Now that was absurd. Just as the volume reached an unbearable peak, the compound's doors were almost blown off their hinges as four of the infamously round Akamichis tumbled out onto the street, their mouths hanging open their eyes bulging and tears streaming down their cheeks. Steam rose comically from their ears as they moaned and screamed at the unbearable sensation they were undoubtedly experiencing in their mouths. Almost immediately, the whole square was in chaos. A good majority of the shoppers didn't wait to find out if it was an attack or something else. They simply dropped whatever was in their hands and ran for home. A small group of alarmed villagers raced to the Akamichis and attempted to find out what was wrong. One brave but stupid villager actually put his hand on the shoulder of the first Akamichi to burst out into the square. Needless to say, the result was explosive. C-H-I-L-L-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-I-
He curled himself tight into a ball and attempted to maneuver his body into a better position to minimize the damage that would be inflicted when he collided with the ground. Damn, if only I could stick to walls I could just reach my feet out and stop my fall. Resigned, he gulped in the rushing air. 50 feet. 40. 30. 10. Suddenly, something caught him in midair and Naruto felt the drag from changing direction at such a high speed. Well at least he wasn't lying in a pool of blood at the bottom of the mountain. Naruto felt the jolt of whatever caught him landing on the ground. Through his adrenaline-hazed senses he realized that it was a person that had caught him, and not just any old person, it was an Anbu. Naruto. Just what the hell did you think you were doing? Naruto turned his head to the left to see Sandane Gigi glaring at him through his labored breathing. Turning to stare up at his savior, he spied a shock of spiked silver hair and the Inu Anbu mask. Turning back to the Hokage he grinned. Yo Gigi, cuz you only taught me two jutsu, I was trying to see how far I could kawari me whilst bungee jumping. You wanna try? It's real fun. The Hokage recoiled at hearing Naruto's declaration. You mean to tell me that you were jumping off of the Hokage mountain for fun? The Hokage's face was by now, apoplectic with rage. Well yeah, when I was pulling my stunt at the Akamichis the other day, I had this idea from replacing myself so many times, see, and so decided to, oops. Naruto slapped a hand over his mouth. He just spilled the beans. So it was you at the Akamichi clan house. I should have known it would be you. I did not teach you ninja techniques for you to cause chaos in this village Naruto. Can't you remember what I told you about what those jutsu are for? Naruto lowered his head, allowing his hair to shadow his eyes. The arms that held him tightened slightly in a more protective hold. Surprised. Naruto looked back up into the ANBU's face but was met with the stoic mask leering back down at him. Shaking himself, Naruto faced the Hokage once again. But Gigi, it ain't my fault that Ya only taught me these two boring jutsu. I wanted to do something fun and that was the only thing I could think of at the time. I can't even do that stupid clone technique. It never comes out right no matter how hard I try. The Hokage sighed. He distantly realized that he had been doing that a lot more frequently these days. At least he had something to say to the Akamichi now, although being honest with himself, he would never name Naruto as the culprit. The boy had too many enemies already to add more to the list. Look Naruto we'll discuss this in my office. You should just think about how scared I was when I looked out of my window and saw you jumping off that mountain. Inu, bring him to my office. With an immediate, hi, Hokage-sama, all three disappeared in a shower of leaves. Naruto snickered evilly into his hand as he walked to his new apartment place that the Hokage had given to him, once he inquired into why he was not at the orphanage when the Hokage had attempted to locate him after the Akamichi incident. Sarutobi was shocked when he found out that the caretakers were regularly kicking Naruto onto the street at night and that Naruto was being forced to sleep in the forest surrounding the village. As he walked he clutched the two new scrolls that he was given by his Gigi. Apparently, one was a control exercise, and the other was a jutsu that allowed him to maximize his chakra output so that it would be easier for the Hokage to find him if he was in trouble. Naruto, however, had a very different use for the jutsu, and he was planning on mastering the technique as soon as possible. He was quite surprised when the Anbu had commented on his reaction time. When, Inu, was asked to report what he had seen he had replied. It was shocking Hokage-sama. Not only did he manage to replace himself with a plank of wood from over 100 feet away, he also did this whilst falling at roughly 50 meters per second. I thought that was incredible, but he also managed to maneuver himself into a position that would cause minimal damage if he was to hit the ground. Naruto felt himself glowing on the inside. Not only did an Anbu say something about him, but also, it was something good. He would be sure to remember this, Inu, in the future. Maybe he could give him some pointers with his chakra control and then he'd be able to tree jump? As soon as he got to his new apartment, he locked the door, chucked his sandals into a corner of the living room and unrolled the chakra control scroll. Or maybe he didn't need any pointers after all. Naruto's grin reached to the corner of his jaw, he rubbed his hands together in childish glee. Oh, this is gonna be good. Sarutobi rubbed the bridge of his nose lightly as he stared down at the mission report resting lightly in his hands. In front of him, stood three of the utmost trustworthy ninja in the Konoha Anbu ranks, as today, was a day of treason and treachery. Habi, Itachi, 
You are totally sure that everything in this report is 100% accurate? The two young men nodded their heads. This spelled bad things for the Konoha military. If it was so easy for someone to infiltrate their forces and remain undetected for so long, Sarutobi no longer knew how trustworthy his forces were. At least the three in front of him could be counted on. So let me get this straight. The recently promoted Chunin, Mizuki, made contact with Orochimaru for the first time whilst on mission code FC-1189. Incidentally, the third teammate of the Genin squad assigned to the mission died, and Mizuki returned as a loyalist to Orochimaru's rebel movement. Since then, he has avoided contact in order to prevent suspicion and had only now made an attempt to procure new orders? Sarutobi frowned. Something didn't quite add up. Hi, Hokage-sama. We received a tip-off at 1,800 hours last night from Chunin Iwashi Tatami. He noticed Mizuki approaching an off-limits area that he was assigned to patrol duty. You'll find the details in the mission report for FC-2767. Anbu Squad D was called and we observed Mizuki making contact with an unidentified ninja. He had no credentials to support him being of another village, however he carried standard shinobi equipment. We overheard their conversation the details of which you can find in the report. It still amazed Sarutobi how Itachi managed to say all that without any change in either volume or tone. Poor boy, no one should be forced to grow up so fast, but then again, the Hokage was being faced with a similar problem with regards to a certain blonde-headed pariah. Turning back to the report he quickly scanned the page to find the conversation he was interested in, and narrowed his eyes at what had been discussed. Here are your orders, don't reply. Don't attempt to make contact and most of all don't tell anyone about this conversation. Orochimaru-sama will not be pleased if you fail in your task, so do not hesitate to remove anyone that stands in your way. Your objective is to obtain the Forbidden Scroll of Seals located in the Hokage's office under a genjutsu on a shelf to the left-hand side of the room. Once you have secured the scroll, move to Sector 5 and await reinforcements. I cannot stress how important it is that you make no attempt to establish contact. If you get there, we will contact you. Not good, not good at all. There were definitely other elements besides Mizuki acting with impunity here, but the whole thing definitely stank of Orochimaru. Few people knew where the Scroll of Seals was located, and although an A-class Genjutsu was used to hide it, the nature of the Genjutsu was such that only if you didn't know the location, it would be effective. So definitely Orochimaru then. It hit the venerable Hokage then what was making him uneasy. Why would Mizuki switch sides? What was his motive to join an infamous missing nin like Orochimaru? He would find out, but right now, national security was at risk. Striding to the aforementioned book shelf, Serutobi released the genjutsu on the scroll and moved it to the Yandaimi's safe. Signaling the three Anbu to listen, he spoke in hushed tones. Inu, Itachi, Habi, Code 54 Red. You know which genjutsu that is so apply a triple layer on the scroll before I shut the safe. The three Anbu were inwardly shocked that Serutobi had enough trust in them to place a genjutsu on an object so important as to warrant a place in the Yandaimi's safe. Nevertheless, they quickly made the hand seals, and whispered in unison. Megan. Kakoni Erizu no jutsu. The air above the scroll swirled until it was replaced by a folder. Serutobi shut the safe and sealed it with his blood, before covering the door with a genjutsu sheet. Now that that is out of the way, we need to neutralize this threat before it has a chance to move. Habi, Itachi, your mission will be to eliminate the traitor Mizuki at once. He is not to make contact with anyone outside his home. I want him taken out before sunrise. You will also need to make sure he cannot escape from his house. I'll leave you to think up the most appropriate method. Next to them, the Anbu in the Inu mask twitched slightly. It seems like you have something to say captain, the Hokage's senses were still very sharp after all. If I may make a suggestion Hokage-sama, at Serutobi's death nod, he continued. I recently witnessed Uzumaki Naruto use the chakra beacon technique in a very unique way, and think that he would be the ideal solution to confining Mizuki. Serutobi raised an eyebrow at that. What could Naruto offer for this situation that the Anbu couldn't? Taking that as his response to continue the elite ninja spoke again. During my patrol of the academy district last week, I encountered a large surge of chakra. I immediately noticed that it was the chakra of Uzumaki Naruto, 
as did you, Hokage-sama, and a few ninja who were on patrol nearby. It was not this that shocked me though. When I arrived on the scene, I noticed a phenomenon that I had never encountered before. Naruto was practicing with the chakra beacon technique and when he had let out the pulse, he managed to spread the beacon widely enough that I was unable to place his exact location. If you were to do this when Mizuki attempts to escape, the traitor will be hard pressed to guard his back and we should be able to eliminate him without trouble. To say that Serutobi was surprised would be a gross understatement. The control required to pull off the chakra beacon was practically non-existent. Shinobi had been using the technique for years as a useful locator on the field, and any ninja who had been present in the third shinobi war would be able to pull it off without any trouble whatsoever. All you had to do was push your chakra out of your body as hard as you can and bingo, immediate beacon for any ninja, friend or foe, within the vicinity. The thing about the technique though, was that you could not control your chakra once it escaped the body. In this way the Hyuga were able to push their chakra out of specific points of their chakra circulatory systems, but that required a huge amount of control. Similarly it was possible to slow the flow of chakra to such speeds that you became invisible to surrounding shinobi. But what Naruto had supposedly done, was to spread his chakra to every chakra pore in his body and release it at the same intensity as that of his chakra flow, and so in effect, cause shinobi to become confused as to where his body was. This was to say the least, very impressive. Seems like he had earned a few more techniques on his next meeting with the Hokage. Smiling, Serutobi nodded his head. It was a good plan. Even if Mizuki saw Naruto, he wouldn't be able to pinpoint where the beacon was coming from and it was very unlikely that he would suspect a six-year-old child of being responsible for such a feat. Okay, that's a good plan. In that case, Inu, you are responsible for this operation. Habi. You are to find and recruit Naruto without letting him know of your true intentions. Do not allow him to find out that this is a mission. Make something up, I don't care, but he is not to find out that he is being used in such a way. Understood? Move out. With a crisp, hi, Hokage-sama, all three disappeared from the office. Serutobi sighed. If Naruto found out, it would not do at all. Naruto smiled happily. He couldn't believe his luck. That snake-masked Anbu had said that she wanted to test his chakra beacon and tree-walking abilities. And he knew it was a woman. No man had such a high voice. He was giddy, and he knew it. He knew it would affect his performance in the upcoming test, but he just couldn't help it. He had been practicing so hard in the half-year or so since Hokage Gigi had given him the two scrolls. To think that the Hokage had given him the very skill he wanted in the tree-climbing control exercise, was the icing on the cake. He had swiftly learned how to channel his chakra to his feet and run up walls. He enjoyed it so much that it was a common sight to see the blonde-haired Jinchuriki jumping from rooftop to rooftop as fast as his small legs could take him. Shaking himself, Naruto remembered that he had a test to pass. It wouldn't do to mess this one up. The Anbu had told him to sit on a bench outside one of Konoha's shinobi residence areas. It was one of the few places that Naruto had hardly ever been to within Konoha, and he couldn't help but notice how the buildings were far better than his apartment. Maybe there are good things about being a Konoha ninja. Before he could think further on it, though a puff of smoke announced the arrival of his examiner. Alright kid, this is how we're gonna do things. I'm gonna be hiding up there and when I give the signal you're gonna use your jutsu and I'll evaluate it. The masked nin pointed to a tree that was heavily shadowed about 10 meters from Naruto's position on the bench. Remember, you have to remain sitting on that bench and act as if you're not the one doing the technique. You understand my explanation for why that technique is so unique right? Naruto nodded. He had been informed that by spreading his chakra he was, in effect, making it harder for ninja to be able to sense him. He already knew he rocked. As the anbu disappeared, Naruto couldn't help but think that he wasn't being told something. Why would this Anbu suddenly want to test him? It wasn't as if Anbu went around testing everyone they thought could do something, unique, did they? Weren't they supposed to be like the super ninja in Konoha? Ah well, better keep my eyes open. And with that, he plopped himself down on the bench and turned to stare at the living quarters in front of him. It was almost as if the Anbu had chosen this bench so that he was facing that building when he did the technique. He quickly shook himself. It wouldn't do to fail this after so much hard work. Mizuki was scared. Scratch that, he was downright terrified. 
The first clue he had that something was very wrong was that he could sense three chakra signatures outside his apartment, and they didn't seem to be going away. Now usually that wasn't a cause for concern, it was a shinobi residency area after all, but the thing that alerted him was that two of the chakra signature were definitely Anbu. Anbu had their own living quarters separate from the other residential areas, so that if any of them flipped out and went on a killing spree due to the stress of their missions getting to them, it was easily contained. He had decided it was too risky to stick around, so without further ado, he gathered as much of his essentials that he could move on short notice, and prepared to leave. Then everything went to hell. Mitarashi Anko, Tokabetsu Junin, codenamed, Habi, in the Anbu Black Ops, sat waiting for Itachi's signal. She spied the blonde kid out of her peripheral vision as she watched the apartment door, senses stretched to their maximum. He was a strange one, that Uzumaki Naruto. He could do things other people couldn't and he was still very innocent, she was hard pressed to understand what the villagers saw in him that warranted their ostracism. As she snuck another glance at the kid, she remembered Sandane's warning. Habi, you are to find and recruit Naruto without letting him know of your true intentions. Do not allow him to find out that this is a mission. Make something up, I don't care, but he is not to find out that he is being used in such a way. Understood? Anko grimaced. If the Hokage had worries about Naruto's state of mind regarding Konoha she didn't think it was a wise choice to have him on this mission. She knew what it was like to bear the brunt of the villagers' hate, and he wasn't the only one who didn't want to help the village. They were both being forced into it. The thing is, nothing ever went to plan with Anbu missions. The reason they were Anbu was because they could adapt to any given situation and still come out on top of their opponents. If something went wrong here, Naruto would very likely find out that he was being used. And she didn't know how well that would sit with the Kayubi kid. She didn't have any more time to ponder the situation though, as the mission finally got started. It was just after midnight when Itachi's clone popped up beside the purple-headed Anbu. Target confirmed moving for the exit. Proceed with stage 2 at your discretion. The clone popped out of existence as quickly as it had come. Anko sighed. Well it was damned if you do, damned if you don't. Mizuki knew the game was up. The Anbu had appeared in the hallway of his lodging and booted the door off its hinges in an explosive show of strength. As the splinters zoomed everywhere, colliding with the walls, Mizuki heard the monotonous voice that emitted from behind the elite ninja's mask. Ex Chunin Mizuki, you have been confirmed as a traitor to the hidden village of the leaves. As per order of Sarutobi Hirazan, the Sandame Hokage of Konoha, you are condemned to immediate execution. The morbid finality of the statement caused Mizuki's anxiety to rise. He was already forming seals before the Anbu had finished speaking. Kawari mi no jutsu. Mizuki replaced himself with a chair in the hallway and immediately made a break for the front door. He couldn't sense the other Anbu. Maybe they had decided he wasn't worth two Anbu? He would show them. He could still sense the small chakra levels of the other person but they were too low to be anything higher than Jenin. It was most probably someone who wasn't involved in his execution. Mizuki almost stopped in surprise when the small chakra was replaced by a much larger one right outside the door. Worst still, he couldn't pinpoint where it was coming from. It was like a hundred chunin had suddenly appeared and spread themselves evenly outside the apartment complex, but that was impossible. He had been so caught up in analyzing the massive chakra signature in front of him that he had almost completely forgotten about the one behind him he was originally escaping from. It was only luck that saved him as he snapped his head round, barely missing the standard issue Anbu Katana hissing by the right side of his head. If the blade had hit home, everything would have been fine. Alas Anko's suspicions were correct. Mizuki backpedaled into the front door, forming seals as fast as he could. He could either fight this Anbu here, or face whatever it was that was outside. He'd pick 100 Chunin over an Anbu any day of the week. Slamming his hands into the door, he called out the best technique he had in his arsenal. Doden. Doryu Dango no Jutsu. Mizuki tore the chunk of wood from the door and hurled it at the masked shinobi, before throwing himself through the hole that he had made. Mizuki immediately began running toward the border of the village. He had to get out as fast as he could, since he had been compromised. As he ran, he glanced about wildly, trying to find the enormous chakra signature that was choking the air. It was like he was being surrounded. 
As he continued running he spied a kid dressed in black pants and a dark blue t-shirt sitting on a bench. It was the Kayubi brat. That was probably the cause of the chakra distortion he was feeling, although it looked like he was just sitting there. In any case his orders were to get rid of anyone in his way, so he snapped a kanai into his hand and got ready to throw. Just as the kid looked up, his eyes widening, the traitor stopped dead in his tracks. He glanced down to see the point of a katana poking out of the front of his chest. He knew he was dead. In his last few breaths in the living world, he raised his head up and stared at the blonde kid that thwarted him, as blood pooled behind his eyeballs, trickling out of his nose and the corner of his mouth. As he slipped off the blade he whispered his last word to the stunned kid. Demon. Damn, damn damn. Anko cursed herself over and over as she leapt down to where Itachi had pulled his sword from the traitorous Chunin's back, splattering the blood all over himself and the blonde Uzumaki. The kid looked like he was hyperventilating, staring wide-eyed at the blood splattered on his hands. He was visibly shaking, and Anko knew he would soon go into shock. It was only then that the Tokubetsu Junin found that there was a much larger problem. Naruto was still spewing the beacon technique like a fountain of water. Not good, not good at all. Sarutobi strode with an agitated gait, as he rushed hurried through the hospital hallways. The report from the latest Anbu mission was damning to say the least. The mission was successful, yes, but the damage inflicted may far outweigh the long-term potential gains of such an audacious move. Naruto was in a highly volatile situation. He had witnessed the demise of the traitorous Konoha Chunin Mizuki, and from the report, seemed to have realized that he had been used. Hubi herself, had reported in on the Jinchuriki's status, and it wasn't looking good. The professionals at the Konoha Central Hospital had concisely reported that the shock from such a revelation from one of the few people of trust to the boy was enough to seriously damage the psychological framework of his brain. Furthermore, he had expended a huge amount of chakra, and Habi was unable to get him to stop before he collapsed in chakra exhaustion. The venerable Hokage didn't know what would happen to a Jinchuriki that expended all of his chakra. But that hadn't been the worst thing, by a long shot. It seemed that the chakra beacon technique had some unforeseen abilities when one such as Naruto used it. After whittling down his own small chakra pool, he had begun to draw on the Kayubi's chakra. As more of the volatile crimson energy was pulled out, the jutsu maximized to even greater heights. What followed was a rush of murderous intent so strong, that the entire village was once again brought to its knees by the sheer magnitude and hate. At least it wasn't directed at anyone, but Hiruzen knew that that was no concession. The deluge of despicably loathing intent caused mass panic and chaos to spread like lightning through the village. The danger level was immediately upgraded to, code red, emergency status and a contingency of Anbu had been dispatched to locate the source, as if nobody knew who it was. It was then that a stray thought struck Serutobi. What if Naruto was able to control the effect of that technique? It would truly become a formidable skill for a shinobi to have. Serutobi shook himself, reminding that Naruto no longer had any care for becoming a Konoha shinobi, let alone using those skills for the good of the village. They were in this situation because they had tried to force his hand. It was just typical that Minato's son would be the type to bite people in the back when confronted with such a situation. Stopping outside room 47, the Hokage hesitated slightly before pushing the door open and walking inside. Naruto sat on the surgical bed bound in bandages, from his head to his toes. If Sarutobi hadn't known the complexity and seriousness of the issue at hand, he would have laughed uproariously at the comical sight presented to him. Yet this was not a time for comedy. How are you feeling Naruto? Sarutobi winced at how the question must have sounded to the blonde-headed bundle of energy. Naruto slowly turned his head to look at his grandfather figure. His sapphire eyes that usually sparkled with mischief and joy were dull and lifeless. His very expression spoke volumes of his psychological state, and Sarutobi was beginning to wonder if there was anything salvageable from this tragedy. I'm fine. His reply was curt. Not a good sign. I don't mean physically Naruto. How are you really feeling? Sarutobi wanted to know his opinion on the events that had occurred the previous morning. Much better than that guy in the cemetery. Sarutobi winced again, so he definitely knew they had used him then. Naruto, you have to understand. We needed that job done. It was for the safety of the village. 
Can you really put your own protection over those of? GG. Don't trick me. Everyone knows that the villagers hate me. Why the hell should I protect them? Why the hell should I even believe a single thing you say to me? The boy's heartfelt question pierced the Hokage's heart like a lightning bolt. Sarutobi was hard pressed to say he understood the trauma that the six year old was going through. The only person in the whole village who may have been able to claim such a thing was Itachi, and that was only if you got him to say something outside of his family time or missions. Sarutobi shook himself from his musings once again. When the old Hokage finally responded to the blonde, who hadn't looked away from, or even blinked it, his Gigi's lowered head. His voice had dropped a little more than a whisper. Because your father did. Naruto's eyes widened in shock and Sarutobi thought he saw a small spark revive in the blonde's blue eyes. What? Sarutobi knew that by affirming that, he was practically asking for trouble, but it seemed like the only way to get the boy out of his funk. I'm not going to tell you who your parents are. I hope you understand that we have reasons, your parents and I, why we are unable to tell you. But let me tell you one thing. Your father sacrificed his life for this village, as did your mother. It was incredibly underhanded for the Sandane to say such a thing when Naruto was in a trough of an emotional whirlwind, and yet he knew that it was his only chance if he was to defuse this situation. I respected your choice to not become a ninja. I gave you the tools to protect yourself from the mindless hatred directed at you, and yet I never questioned your intentions Naruto. Are you questioning mine? Sarutobi didn't stop to consider if that was a fair question to ask a six-year-old. At the moment, all he could see was the Yandaimi's sole remaining progeny, one of outstanding strength and resiliency. And it was then that the veteran Shinobi knew that Naruto would pull through this crisis. Respect? The word was spoken so softly that Hiruzen almost didn't catch it. You think you respected me? You didn't respect me? You gave me the lamest skills that every ninja knows. You made me live in that orphanage for five years Gigi. I respected you, and you threw that in my face. You knew I didn't want to be a Shinobi. And now look Gigi, I have blood on my hands. Naruto's voice fell to a whisper once again, like the small sound of a passing breeze on a warm summer's day. I have blood on my hands. Sarutobi felt his heart wrench in his chest as Naruto raised his hands to look at them. His eyes were wide and trembling, and his whole body shook like a wooden training post as a look of pure grief and terror settled onto the child's face. Tears welled up and slipped over the edge of his eyelids, and he immediately scrunched his face up and buried his head in his hands. You think I'm stupid, don't you Gigi? You think I don't know about that bad red stuff inside me? I know that's why the villagers call me monster. I saw the color of his blood and it was the same color as that stuff. His whole body was shaking now, and Sarutobi was straining to hang on to every word that came out of his mouth. Why do you think I wanted to learn ninja techniques? To make myself forget about this. He let forth a gut-wrenching sob. I wanted to forget this feeling. This, this, loneliness and sadness. I didn't want to be sad anymore. I didn't want to wake up in the morning with the picture of people shouting at me, or throwing things at me in my head over and over again. Can't you see why I don't want to remember all this? Can't you see Gigi? Naruto's eyes were beginning to bulge, red lines of tiredness and madness stretching almost to his iris. Sarutobi registered this as a bad sign. He realized it then, what Naruto truly wanted. He had wanted it all his life, but had ruthlessly bottled it up in his heart for the sake of the survival of his sanity. It was also then that Sarutobi realized just how bad Jinchuriki's lives could be. The pain and emotional suffering that a human could go through was epitomized by their existences and experiences. And Naruto faced all of that with very little support. He was indeed his mother and father's son. Sarutobi rushed forward and enveloped the youngster in a tight hug. He realized now what the boy had been trying to tell him these past two years. His happiness and joy was only a facade to hide the very nature of his existence hurting those around him. He was trying to shield everyone from the pain he felt from having no parents, from being scorned from nearly every direction and most of all, from his own anger and confusion. But Sarutobi knew now. He knew what his intentions were all along, he just didn't recognize them for what they were. And damned he would be, if Sarutobi didn't support him. Naruto was stumped. Tree walking was easy. He did it in two days. Water walking was more difficult, it took him four days. But what he was trying to do now was causing far more trouble. The question was, would it be worth it? Tree walking regulated chakra to the feet, 
allowing a shinobi to stick himself to the surface. One would need to regulate a constant flow of the blue energy to the hardest part of the body, the feet, in order to strengthen the muscles and cause the foot to adhere to the tree. Trees were used as they were generally the hardest surfaces to build up this adhesion, due to their rough yet solid bark. Similarly, water walking built upon the basis of regulating chakra to one's feet, yet the principle behind it was quite different. The user had to constantly change the output of chakra to match the change of the surface, i.e. water. Water was especially good as a training site as it struck a balance between viscosity and volatility. The thing about water walking was that when you needed to change direction you had to take into account how the water would move and how the chakra would cause a spray. Naruto had decided that, to maximize his training and enjoyment, he would ski, without skis. He had watched Konoha villagers water skiing using boats or hang gliders and he thought why not try a much more extreme version. He had chakra to burn and the mind to use it, although some people differed on the latter. So, here he was attempting to propel himself forward by pushing an insane amount of chakra out of his feet and ankles whilst trying to control his direction and balance at the same time. Suffice to say, the results were painful. Boom! Naruto gingerly extracted himself from the latest indent he had bashed into the rock from his latest collision. Wincing, he stretched himself checking for any injuries. That arm was going to be tender in the morning. Setting himself he got ready to try again. With an audible explosion of chakra, he rocketed forward, water parting up and in front of him creating a sparkling fountain of spray that caught the sunlight as it descended back to the river's surface. He was really enjoying himself this time. The feeling of the water slapping his skin under the sun as he blasted his path through the mammoth sentinels of water on either side of him put him in a state of euphoria he hadn't ever experienced before. He stared ahead, looking in awe at the golden sparkle of the sun, its rays reflecting magnificently off the diamonds of water drops hanging in the air around him. It was as if he was in a tunnel of silver and gold each complementing the other in an unnatural balance that only something all-powerful could ever have created. In that moment of introspection, he once again lost his concentration. It was too late for him to slalom around the smooth curved rock that jutted out of the center of the river. With another deft boom, the blonde-haired Jinchuriki was lifted a sheer meter above the water's surface. With the wind from his ferocious speed dragging against his skin and the sound roaring past his ears, he yelled his challenge to the sky. Woohoo! And with that exclamation, after a good three seconds of hang time, he fell back to the surface with a resounding clap. His feet stinging and his body shaking from the adrenaline rush of the craziest move he had tried yet, he laughed uproariously. I have got to do that again. Alas, the wall didn't agree. Crack. Naruto was happy. It was the first and last thought on his mind at the moment. After a straight six days of practice, he had gotten the hang of the most dangerous sport he had ever decided to do. After the first three days of which the afternoon was always spent in the hospital, he had strengthened his resolve to steady his balance and get it right. He deduced that to do this successfully, as he had seen on the Konoha beaches, he needed a source of tension to aid his balance. The conventional water skiers were always attached by rope to something that was pulling them across the river. However, there was a fundamental difference between their way and his. He was propelling himself across the surface and so he didn't have anything to tie himself to. So he had decided that if he couldn't use something to speed him up to use for this tension, he would use something to slow himself down. Hence, the 10 kilograms rock that was tied to his waist with ninja wire. Using the basics of physics, this had allowed him to balance himself by leaning back into the tensile force acting on his body due to the inertia from the rock effectively lowering his center of gravity and his speed, although the latter was only slight. Cackling madly, he shot off down his makeshift watercourse before slamming into his quasi-ramp of a rock and lifting himself airborne. It was fast becoming his favorite move, as the rush of the skiing with senses stretched to overload was suddenly replaced with a feeling of calm and solitude as he hung in the air. From his vantage point, he could see just beyond the edge of the waterfall that this particular river led to, the luscious green trees hanging down on either side as if inviting anyone to go through them. Naruto had neglected to notice a very big part of physics though, and it would cost him, or rather, anyone who was unfortunate enough to be walking around near the river at this very moment in time. You see, when a weight is tied behind a moving object, it moves at the same speed due to it having a physical bond to the momentum. 
However, when the moving object stops or slows down, the tension in the connection falls and the object being pulled continues at the same momentum at which it was originally. With an audible twang, Naruto glanced up as his axle rock went zooming over his head. Crap, I'm gonna get pulled along at this rate. It'll break me in half if I get caught in that. And so, flipping out a kunai stored in his three quarters s, he sliced the connection between himself and the rock. Naturally that meant the rock was no longer tied to anything. The now unrestricted, airborne projectile zoomed away from him, angling out towards the tree line to the left of the river. Naruto heard a piercing shout before a solid thump was heard and moderate amount of dirt and stone exploded into the air above the tree line. Ouch. Naruto winced, that's gotta hurt. Quickly, he shot a burst of chakra to his feet and sped to where the stone had disappeared beyond the trees. Shaking himself, he ran as fast as he could to see if he had hurt anyone. Please let no one have died from that. Hurrying to the crater he had spied, he noticed a black, human-shaped lump lying on the ground. Shouting in worry, the blonde-headed daredevil ran as fast as he could to check up on his unfortunate victim. Damn, it was an Uchiha. Naruto recognized the white and red fan symbol painted to the back of this particular ninja's top. Mister, hey mister, you okay? Naruto began to panic when the guy didn't move. It was an Uchiha alright. The same pale skin, tightly stretched to the bone like porcelain, allowed Naruto to identify the stranger with certainty. Anxiously dropping to his knees, Naruto placed his index and forefinger against the teenager's throat to see if he was still alive. He detected a faint pulse, the guy was alive, but unconscious. Sighing in relief, Naruto sat back on his haunches and regarded the unfortunate victim. The stone had left a big bump on the left side of his head, just missing the shinobi's eye. The projectile had no doubt crushed the Uchiha's left cheekbone and blood was running down the side of the nin's face. If it had hit his eye, Naruto shuddered. He didn't even want to think about what the Uchiha would try to do to him if he damaged one of their precious demon eyes. The clan would hound him wherever he went and they were bad enough as it was already, putting subtle genjutsu on him to make him walk into things whenever they locked eyes with him. It was a disgusting trick, one they exploited when they noticed his obvious weakness in that particular field. He was beginning to become very careful about avoiding people's eyes when he saw that cursed symbol anywhere. Nevertheless, he had to get this guy to the hospital, to make sure he didn't end up dying. Hoisting the limp body onto his straining shoulder, he began the arduous trek to the one building he hated the most. Konoha Central Hospital. Itachi stared impassively at the scene behind his mask. He had missed his target due to unforeseen consequences. That was not good. His master would be very displeased with this turn of events. Narrowing his eyes at the blonde Uzumaki, questions continued to rage in his head. The boy was strong, unbelievably so. If Itachi had to estimate, he would say the brat was at his level when he had been his age. That would make him just above Chunin. But what he had seen earlier was unbelievable. The strength of mind and concentration required in controlling one's movement on the surface of the water going at that speed? It was hard. Something Itachi thought only a genius from the Hyuga or Uchiha clans would be able to pull off. And this boy had done it in six days. He had been assigned to watching the Uzumaki this week, and was rapidly changing his opinion of the kid. He was about Sasuke's age and yet, he was far more skilled. But his mark had escaped, and that would delay things indefinitely. There would be no better chance than the one he had just missed, not to mention that his ultimate mission would also be postponed. And that was by far a bigger and more important task. One that was reliant on his failed objective of the day. Yes, his master would not be pleased. At all. Naruto waited anxiously in the lounge of Konoha's biggest and most famous hospital, Konoha Central Hospital. It was located next to the largest and most important building of the village, the Hokage Tower, and it was rumored to have been established by the legendary medic and one of the three Sanin, Senju Tsunade. The hospital had been founded some 20 years prior, which was fairly new in the village, as most of the buildings were the original ones built when Konoha was founded, especially this close to the village center. War and Kayubi had never reached this far in and so much of the infrastructure was the same as it had been since Konoha's inception. Naruto peered forlornly out of the window. He wondered absently how it would have been if he had been born when the village was first built. He wondered what the first and second Hokages were really like. 
All he had to go on were the two faces carved into the stone of Hokage Mountain, and that in his six and a half year old opinion, meant they looked like bloated frogs. I wonder what the Naidem would look like with Akamichi swirls on his cheeks. Grinning internally, he decided to save that thought for later. He may be able to cook up a plan or two that would let him know just what it would look like. Kicking his legs under the plastic seat he was currently situated on, he turned to stare at the door to the examination room that the Uchiha he had knocked out had been taken to. Naruto dearly hoped that nothing serious had happened to him. It was bad enough that he was hated by almost everyone in the village without them resorting to physical violence, and this could be dire if news were to get out that he had hurt an actual shinobi. As he continued to stress over the current issue, the Anbu code named Inu opened the door and stepped out. The stoic mask was turned in the blonde's direction, but he didn't know if the elite ninja was actually looking at him or not. It was always kind of creepy for Naruto, seeing all these animal-faced masks directed at him, yet not knowing to what exactly the sight of the person underneath was really directed. Shaking himself from his rapidly derailing thoughts, he cleared his throat. Anbu san, is that Uchiha okay? Naruto waited for the response with wide, anxious eyes. The mask remained silent for a few seconds, which did nothing to reassure the blonde headed prankster. Uzumaki Naruto, was it truly you who knocked Uchiha Shisui, a shinobi of Junin rank, unconscious? The voice was almost as bad as the mask, Naruto thought unconsciously. He was in deep trouble now. The guy had been a freak in Junin. There was absolutely no point in trying to lie his way out, he was sure the Anbu had some technique that allowed him to detect lies. Air, yeah, but it ain't what you're thinking Anbu San. See, I was water skiing with my chakra and I needed something to balance myself like the villagers do with their ropes. So I tied a rock to my waist, see, and it worked. Just I went too fast and when I stopped the rock went flying. Dot and that guy just happened to be there. Dot and it weren't my fault I swear. Naruto panted after speaking so fast for so long with hardly a pause. The Anbu seemed to scrutinize him even more minutely after his ill-gotten explanation, and that made Naruto's nerves even more brittle. Water skiing, it was more a question than a statement and Naruto responded quickly. Yeah, see, Gigi gave me this scroll for water walking and I decided to ski using it. I really didn't mean to hit that guy, honest. And please don't tell the Uchiha anything about this, I'll be dead by evening. Naruto was about ready to run as far as he can without stopping, to be away from anything remotely close to the Uchiha, unless the Anbu put him at ease. At least on this occasion, the elite ninja was nice enough to oblige, although Naruto had a strange sense of awareness at that point that the shinobi didn't want to turn him in anyway. He wondered at the reason for that. Uchiha Shisui is not dead, neither is he grievously injured. He has already recovered from this ordeal and seems to find much hilarity in the fact that he was bested by a flying stone. I will not be reporting you to the Uchiha, but I must report this to the Hokage. I will be going now. Pausing to regard the blonde for a second, Inu disappeared in a burst of falling leaves. In Naruto's relief clouded mind, one thought stood out most. I have got to learn that technique. Feeling much safer now that he had gotten out of harm's way, Naruto decided to offer his sincerest apologies to his unwilling victim. Pushing open the door to room 182, he sidled as quietly as he could into said Uchiha's current residence. As he walked in, he spied the Uchiha sitting up in the overly white hospital bed with a slight grin on his face. Naruto thought that that was as good a sign as any, and decided to announce his presence. Hey Uchiha-san, I'm really really sorry about what happened. You're alright right? The teenager turned his head to regard the entree, and upon seeing the worried face of his aggressor, burst into laughter. Ah ha 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 He then proceeded to gulp in air for his fit of hysteria and croak out, done in by a stone. And by Uzumaki no less. A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A. To Naruto, the last of his inhibitions fell away. Anyone who laughed like that was a nice guy in his book. Well you see Uchiha-san. I was us in that rock for my water skiing and I kinda lost control of it. Going too fast I think. Said Uchiha wiped his eyes from the tears of laughter that had been running down his porcelain skin. He seemed much calmer now that he had laughed so much. Ah, oh, no worries kid. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and I paid the price for it. These things happen. I just can't believe that the first time I get unintentionally knocked out was by a kid with a stone. 
That's just too much. Naruto smiled at the boisterous reply. I was just scared that your family would come get me if you were hurt. At that quiet admission, the Uchiha's mood turned somber. No one's going to hurt you kid. I'm not going to tell my family how I got knocked out. Frankly, it was worth it for the laugh. But Naruto knew there was more to his explanation than that. Maybe he had more allies than he thought. Well, I'm glad you're okay. But I gotta go now Uchiha-san. Again I'm really sorry for what happened. With a small wave of his hand, the Junin dismissed the apology and smiled as the blonde Uzumaki escaped his room. His expression turned melancholy as he contemplated his untimely injury. That stone had been flying fast. Too fast to have been thrown, that was for sure. There was no way that he could have predicted such a situation and even he, the famed Shinkaru no Shisui, could not dodge such a fast-moving and unpredictable projectile. Just how had the kid managed it? There was more to the blonde Jinchuriki than was common knowledge, and Shisui wanted to know more. Maybe Itachi would know, he had been assigned to watching the kid this week. With a start, Shisui remembered why he had been in that location. He needed to move immediately. There was absolutely no telling what was going on within the Uchiha at the moment, and he didn't know if he really wanted to know. He attended the meetings, yes, but many thought him untrustworthy due to his close friendship with the chronically absent Itachi. Hence his mission to spy on his friend. The Uchiha wanted assurances of his loyalty. But who would he choose? His clan? Or his brother in Alba blood? Naruto literally skipped down the streets of Konoha as he made his way towards his apartment. He had been extraordinarily lucky today, and he didn't want to ruin the day by doing something stupid. He had gotten off scot-free and he was very happy at this moment. So happy was he, that he didn't notice a slightly taller female figure approaching him as he mindlessly skipped down the cobblestone street in front of the hospital. So it was a shock when he smacked into something and fell backwards onto his behind with stars swimming over his eyes. Ow. Hey what was that for? Upon raising his head, he recognized his assailant at the same time she recognized him. Hey you're. They said at the same time with fingers pointed at the other. Noticing the absurdity of the situation, both burst out laughing as they regarded one another. The girl was wearing black jogging bottoms with a white t-shirt. Her hair was done up in twin buns which reminded Naruto of the pandas he used to look at in his storybooks when he was younger. Her skin was very pale, almost as if she hadn't been out of a building in quite a while. Aren't you? Again they both started simultaneously. With a grin, Naruto waved his hand at her to go first. You're that guy that used to get chucked out of the orphanage for coming home late all the time, Naruto right? Naruto grimaced. That was not a nice memory, although thankfully, he never had to go back there again. Yeah, that's me. Ain't you that girl who volunteered to cook every night? Naruto scratched the back of his neck. That wasn't a particularly distinct personality trait, but at their age he thought it was something weird. Why cook when there were adults there to do it for you? He hardly ever cooked and he was living by himself. What can I say, there were knives in the kitchen. Naruto shivered as a memory hit him. Once he had been hungry and decided to check the orphanage kitchen for some food, he might be able to sneak something out when no one was looking. As he entered the kitchen, something sharp and shiny flew by his head, burying itself into the wall right next to his ear. He remembered the manic smile of the girl in question and as he stared back at the present incarnation, the image of the past and present overlay each other. Naruto shivered again. This girl was scary, right? Well I'm as sorry for be bumping into you, but I really gotta be getting home now, s so I'll be going now. And with that, he turned and began to jog in the opposite direction. Hey wait, Naruto paused, where did you go? I mean, it's been almost two years since anyone saw you. How come you're not at the orphanage anymore? Naruto turned slightly to see the older girl on her feet with her hand outstretched. Honestly he didn't think any of the kids from the orphanage cared where he was. Once he had come home late at night and they had all stayed up to watch him get in trouble with the patrons. He had never had any friends there, and so he didn't know why this girl was asking him where he went. Why do you care? He knew that came out snider than he meant it, but he couldn't take it back. The girl visibly recoiled as if she was slapped. She remained quiet for a moment, almost as if she were considering the question. I didn't like what they used to do to you, if that's what you mean. I thought it was stupid that they would kick you out after you got in trouble for being out in the first place. I was always dragged along with the others, 
but I always thought that you should be able to do everything like everyone else. It was his turn to look shocked. So someone did care about the treatment he had been getting. Well at least she wasn't one of the bullies then. Hokage Gigi gave me an apartment for myself. I've been living there ever since. The girl's eyes widened in shock at the familiarity with which the blonde spoke of the Hokage, the strongest and wisest shinobi in the village. She had been attending the ninja academy for as long as the disappearance of the blonde and so had learned that the correct Hokage, the Sandane, was known throughout the world as, the professor, for his knowledge and use of ninjutsu. Distantly, she wondered why she hadn't seen the blonde at the academy, surely he was attending. How come I haven't seen you at the academy then? Naruto shrugged. Don't want to be a ninja, so I didn't bother to sign up. The girl looked visibly startled. He didn't want to be a ninja? Practically everyone wanted to be a shinobi after hearing about them all their short lives. Ten Ten was an orphan like Naruto, and so didn't have parents to tell her what being a shinobi was like. Instead, all she had to go on were the legendary battles that all the kids knew that were told to them as bedtime stories. She really couldn't comprehend anyone not wanting to be a ninja. Look, it's getting cold and dark out here. You want to come back to my house and we can talk about whatever you want there? Naruto was getting tired of the conversation, and people were starting to stare at the odd pair. He was beginning to see the scowls of anger on some of the villagers' faces as they noticed just who the boy was. Um, are you sure? I mean I don't want to cause trouble or anything. The girl was looking more startled from before. Perhaps his offer had been rash, he hoped it wouldn't turn into an interrogation session. Waving his hand, he replied, It's okay, don't worry. It's cold out here, and Gigi will get mad at me if I get sick. Unless you need to get back to the orphanage? The girl blanched at that. She was in the academy. She was no longer that restricted anymore. Alright, I'll come. And with that she jogged up to Naruto's side and they began the trek to Naruto's home. By the way I'm 1010. Naruto grinned. Oh, right, I thought it was Tonton. In a dimly lit room, at the back of a gambling parlor of a distant town, a pink pig farted. What the hell? That stinks. Get out of here woman. And take your stinking pig with ya. Tsunade of the Sanin grumbled as she was forced to vacate another gambling game, this time due to her shameful pet pig. Tauntin, why the hell did you have to fart? And what have you been eating? That really stinks. A dark-haired woman next to the famous shinobi snickered. It was never dull with her sensei around. It had been approximately half a year since Naruto had had his ill-fated meeting with one brown-haired panda-styled aspiring Kunoichi. The day that he had invited her back to his house to talk, she had ended up snoring on his couch and Naruto was loath to move someone who was so comfortable, especially someone who had experienced the harshness of the same orphanage he had been forced to endure. Somehow, Ten Ten had taken a liking to his apartment and began to live there, without any sort of permission from Naruto. He vividly remembered returning late in the evening from training one day, to find that the troublesome girl had barricaded herself in his bedroom after throwing most of his stuff into the hallway. Since then, Naruto had been forced to give her his bedroom whilst his sleeping equipment became the couch and a spare blanket he had dug up from one of the storage cupboards. Retrospectively, Naruto was glad to have any sort of company, although he tried not to show it. It irked him whenever he saw how friends treated each other playing and joking outside on the streets, and it was something that the blonde Jinchuriki had never really been able to experience. And so, the bun-haired academy student became one of life's constants for Naruto. Apart from her dangerous love of all things pointy, she was generally a bouncy and interesting personality to interact with, which was portrayed in full on one trip to Ichiraku Ramen earlier that year. Ten Ten had been happily mooching off a bowl of vegetable ramen when a boy from her academy class had walked by. Evident by his pale, pupil-less eyes, the Hayuga in question had taken a swift sneering glance in the girl's direction, before swishing his head and mumbling something that Naruto didn't quite pick up under his breath. Quicker than a cat after a mouse, Ten Ten had flicked a kanai she had stowed in her black t-shirt, at the arrogant youth, barely missing the top of his head. Try saying that to my face, emo boy. And with that threat, the obviously shaken boy, although he tried very hard to retain his stoic demeanor, scowled and hurried off in whatever direction his destination lay. Naruto had also been forced to watch out for stray kanai. The bun-haired girl loved to throw the things around, and it was fast becoming her favorite pastime to use Naruto as her target. When the Sandame had found out about Naruto's new apartment companion, 
He was pleasantly surprised that the boy had finally made a friend around his own age. The Hokage had been quick to notify the orphanage that Ten Ten would not be returning there as she had found a new home, and could only hope that Naruto's psyche would take a huge boost from this positive development. Naruto, himself, had progressed quickly. After the Uchiha Shisui incident, Sarutobi had inquired as to how he had managed such a feat, and upon learning Naruto's astounding level of mastery of the water walking control exercise, had bestowed the Namikaze legacy with a few new scrolls. Naruto had almost salivated when he had seen the titles, there was one technique for each of the main elemental affinities. The sixth and final scroll was the last of the basic chakra control techniques, and the Sandame was sure that even if he hadn't given the air pads scroll to the boy, he would have figured it out himself, especially after he had heard that Naruto could do the same thing on water. It was possible to concentrate a large, dense amount of chakra to the feet, and cause the body to hover slightly off the ground. This did not mean that a shinobi could fly, as no one had ever had the chakra capacity to push such a large amount of chakra out of the soles of their feet for a constant amount of time. There were a few instances in history, where a budding junin had tried just such an idea, and had ended up dead from chakra exhaustion, or from blood loss due to blowing their feet clear off their bodies. Not a nice way to die that was for sure. In any case, it made tree jumping a whole lot easier as a ninja would be able to propel themselves forward as they jumped, in short bursts. Air was far harder to control than water was, as it was far more volatile, and so this made for an excellent chakra control exercise, before moving on to elemental control. Naruto had spent four months learning two of the offensive jutsus and the air pads. He had managed the gukaku and the daitapa, but was nowhere near close to mastering them. Of the other jutsu, the Suiryuden, Shinju Zanshu and Habana were all out of the seven-year-old's reach, but he was determined to master them as well. Naruto had, in the last six months, observed Ten Ten going to and from school each day. He was curious to know how much stronger the academy students were than he, and upon asking his flatmate, she had replied that they hadn't really learned anything. Really? I mean you haven't even learned the hench or the bunshin? Naruto exclaimed in shock. Ten Ten looked visibly startled. How do you know about those techniques? We've only just started learning them and we've been at the academy for two years. Obviously there was something very wrong with the academy. Um, Ten Ten, do you listen in class? Said girl sweat dropped at the question. Of course I do. What's that supposed to mean anyway? Seeing that she had taken his innocent question slightly offensively, he quickly explained himself. Well, I'm not going to the academy but I learned the Kawarimi and Henge techniques ages ago. Naruto scratched the back of his head in confusion. That couldn't be right, could it? Wait, what? You can do ninjutsu? Since when? I mean why the hell would you want to when you don't even want to be a shinobi? Naruto was taken aback by the question. He knew it would eventually come up, but when Ten Ten hadn't asked him the night she had come round, he thought she didn't really care. Well ya see, people used to try and attack me sometimes, and don't ask me why cuz I don't know either, so Gigi gave me some scrolls to let me defend myself. After two weeks, Ten Ten had slowly accustomed herself to Naruto's familiarity with the venerable Hokage. She recognized that they had a strong, almost familial bond and so she no longer thought it odd when he referred to him with such easygoing terms. Eyes wide in anticipation, she immediately asked the first question on her mind. Scrolls? Wait, Naruto can I see them? Shrugging, Naruto stood and retrieved three scrolls from his battered bookshelf. Reseating himself, he rolled the techniques over to his friend. Those are the Bunshin, Kawarimi and Henge techniques. I've already learned them so you can go ahead and keep them, although I could never pull off the Bunshin. Maybe you'll be able to do it? The girl's eyes shone almost with the same intensity as when she hit a bullseye with her kanai. Scooping them up, she ran to her room and slammed the door. Naruto probably wouldn't get any sleep that night if the shouts of Bunshin no Jutsu were any indication. The two had fast become close friends after that. Although Naruto thought Ten Ten was practically his sister, he refrained from calling her Oni-chan for fear of upsetting her. Family was a touchy subject to most orphans, as Naruto could attest to himself. Once Ten Ten had caught on to the fact that Naruto was a better ninja than anyone at the academy she had not stopped badgering him to come to the academy to teach some of the idiots there a lesson. Seriously, she had begged, just once. You can beat this emo guy up and then leave. It'll be really funny. 
Naruto had tried to shoot down every one of her attempts, the kids always bullied him before, what difference would there be now? And there was no way in hell he was going to join the academy. After five months of constant pestering, Ten Ten had finally gotten the blonde-headed boy to agree to attend one day with her, but only after she had explained how many different opportunities there were for pranks at the school. And so Naruto awoke at 6 a.m. on a Monday morning, ready to cause mass mayhem at the one place he swore he would never set foot in. At least, he thought, it won't be a waste of breaking a promise. Oh yes, the whole academy will cry today. Dot hey, even Ten Ten, although her tears will be from laughing so hard. Pure chaos had erupted that day at the academy. The Chunin senseis had arrived that morning to find their classrooms in a state that suggested the academy had been hit by some extremely localized hurricane. Not a single room was left untouched. Chairs and tables lay overturned, rude words chalked on every blackboard and in one classroom. The tap of a corner sink had been turned on fully and left to flood the room. For one Hayuga Neji, all this was but a trifling matter. It would not do for one as prestigious as him to lose his cool over something as petty as a closed-minded prankster. He sat with an intense expression on his face, staring resolutely at his sensei, Miyamura Hokairo. The Chunin was currently attempting to dry up his desk after having spent half the day teaching out in the courtyard due to his submerged classroom. Miyamura looked decidedly agitated that not only had the academy been turned upside down, but also, the culprit had not been found. It was most perplexing that no one had seen anyone out of the ordinary, and with the level of destruction he had witnessed, it was impossible for any of the students to have managed it. Neji, humped, mentally at the stupidity of it all, calls himself a ninja, and yet even the children of the Hayuga branch house acted with more maturity and decorum. He didn't even stop to ponder just how ridiculously hypocritical it was for him to think that. Of course he wouldn't be saying that if he knew what was about to happen to him. Even the stoic Hayuga would be running away screaming at the top of his lungs. Of course, for one, ten ten, this day had been the most eventful and memorable day in her decidedly short life. She had witnessed the total annihilation of all things orderly in a few short hours, and all it took was some ninja wire, a few traps and a well-aimed kanai. Obviously, when Naruto had suggested his plan for the day, she had taken the kanai role for herself. It was a kanai for God's sake. And so here she sat, trying not to laugh like a lunatic in the midst of the war zone, whilst she contemplated emo boys approaching demise. She had thought Naruto was good at shinobi techniques when she had found out how many techniques he knew. She had been very, very wrong. He wasn't just good, he was a genius, but not the sort that many people thought of when associated with that word. Naruto was not book smart. He couldn't understand half of an adult conversation. Neither could he put anything but the most basic statements to use, and seemingly, if the scrolls the Sandame had given him were any indication, the Hokage had noticed this too. No, Naruto was amazing in his application of said techniques. He could take something so basic, and twist it into something so different that not only would you wonder if he had created an entirely new technique, but also if his head was screwed on correctly. For instance, he had just shown an astounding ability to combine the water walking technique with the henge. By modulating his chakra with the air around him he had caused the henge to disguise himself as air. He could still be detected from his chakra signature and if someone got close enough to touch him, but the former problem was resolved when he used the chakra beacon technique in order to mask his true location. Oh, everyone knew there was an imposter on the academy grounds today, but nobody knew where it was, although it was definitely in Miyamura Sensei's classroom. Hence, why Miyamura Sensei was so edgy. Anything with a chakra signature that large could very well be a problem for him. It was decidedly Chunin level after all. Ten Ten stared at the back of Hayuga Neji's head, waiting for the fireworks, and sure enough as Miyamura Sensei left the room to report that the chakra signature hadn't moved but all was well, a small stream of fire seemingly appeared out of thin air and lit the elitist Hayuga's, oh so precious, hair on fire. Ten Ten cackled so loud, that everyone including an oblivious Neji, turned to stare at her as if she had sprouted a Ninkin's head out of the one she already had. Tears streaming down her face, she managed to raise a trembling finger at the Hayuga prodigy. Emo face. Ahaha. Dot hey. Your. Ahaha. Ahaha. Ah Why your hair's on fire. After that exclamation, she tumbled off the side of her chair, 
rolling with manic hilarity, before gasping for breath and pounding on the flooring in mirth. The Hyuga snorted, peefed, as if anyone could light his beautiful hair on fire. The hair he spent 30 minutes grooming into the fitting Hyuga style of perfection. That was, until another classmate turned from watching the currently indisposed Kanai lover and gasped. Um, Hyuga-san, your hair really is on fire. Neji felt and then, the searing heat that began to permeate his scalp. It took a moment to register in his rigorously trained mind that he was on fire, as in, actually burning. As in, him, Hyuga Neji, prodigy of the Hyuga branch house, was flaming in the middle of a wooden classroom, screaming like a little girl. The branch house prodigy bolted up and ran to the overflowing sink whose tap had been hastily plugged due to someone gluing it in the maximum on state. Dunking his head in the most unsightly manner into the overflowing basin, he put the fire out before sighing and groggily extracting his sopping cranium from the sink. Ten Ten had by now, slightly recovered from her bout of hysteria, and upon seeing the state of the half-burnt and soggy Hayuga's hair which had smoke curling from the burnt and ragged split ends, once again burst into uncontrolled laughter. This time as she fell off her chair, the poor furniture snapped due to the sudden shift in weight, and she tumbled to the floor laughing all the while. Hayuga Neji was not amused. His hair was wet and ruined, and there was no one to juke in into next Monday. He settled for going home with dignity. That is, screaming and crying. As Naruto left the academy grounds that day with a broad grin on his face, he wondered absently if this is what every day would have been like if he had decided to attend the academy. He knew subconsciously that it wouldn't have been anything like what had happened today. For one he wouldn't have learned the stuff he did in order to pull off 99% of what he had done and so he resigned himself to simply supporting 1010 on her way to becoming a genin instead. As he turned off the road that the academy was situated on, he bumped into someone roughly around his own age. Hey watch where you're going. Naruto stepped back in surprise. The guy looked sort of like Shisui-san. You're an Uchiha. It was more a statement than a question. The boy looked taken aback for a second before he regained his composure. Yeah, I am. So what? That means I'm better than everyone else. Naruto instantly glared at the boy after his admission, and to think that he thought the guy might be like Shisui. Well sore Rai Mr. Uchiha, I'm sorry I dirtied your spotless clothes. This was definitely not the ending that Naruto wanted to his fine day. Noticing the jab the blonde Jinchuriki had made at his disheveled state, the young Uchiha scowled. It wasn't his fault he had gotten dirty from his training. What would a civilian know about being a ninja anyway? As a ninja, he was an elite of society, and as an Uchiha he was practically royalty to them. Naruto saw the anger and arrogance flit across the face of the boy in front of him and knew that it would be quickly followed by violence. And so he decided to end the standoff in a decidedly Naruto-ish fashion. By burping in the Uchiha's face. Boor rrrrp. The Uchiha's nose immediately scrunched up as it was saturated by the deluge of foul-smelling gas that spewed from the blonde's mouth. As his mind attempted to comprehend just what was assailing his senses, all notion of his surrounding temporarily vacated his mind. Naruto, on seeing his opponent's preoccupation with his chemical warfare, took this as his cue to leave. Pushing a moderate amount of chakra to his feet, he launched himself into the air, spraying the prideful youth with a smattering of mud, dirt and stones. To add insult to injury, as he landed on the nearest rooftop he shouted. Smell ya later. And with that he took off running at top speed towards his apartment. It was a further five minutes before the Uchiha realized just what his aggressor had said, and in his rage, he swung his head in every direction, attempting to locate the source of his ire. If he ever saw that blonde-headed idiot again, he was going to murder him. Sasuke, what are you doing and, oh, what's that smell? Sasuke's head whipped around and his body jolted as if struck. His academy sensei, Amino Uruka, had been approaching the corner of the street and now stood with a look of slight surprise and disgust on his face. His eyes wide, like a rabbit caught in headlights, he bolted for the Uchiha district in a change of clothes. It would only be another few hours before the young Uchiha realized that his blonde-haired enemy had used chakra in his jump, and it would cause him to have a sleepless night angrily pondering how a civilian could do something he could not. Just who was that blonde anyway? It all started when 1010 decided to illuminate Naruto with regards to birthday parties. 
Three weeks had passed in a BLUR of laughter and fun for the two preteens since the academy fiasco. They had become nigh inseparable as a bond of mischief and camaraderie had formed between them. So when Naruto had mentioned in passing that he had never experienced a birthday party, Ten Ten decided to educate him by using her own birthday as an excuse. It had started out like normal. They had awoken that morning to a beautiful summer's day, birds chirping and a slight breeze wafting in through the windows of Naruto's apartment. Ten Ten had been a ball of excitement and energy from the moment her eyes had opened. She would never reveal to her blonde-haired companion that this was her first birthday party too. She wanted both of them to enjoy it as much as possible and so didn't want to ruin the airy atmosphere that had been built up in the days leading up to the occasion. Naruto had woken up slightly earlier than the bun-haired girl and proceeded to pour out two bowls of cereal and two glasses of orange juice, ready for both as soon as Ten Ten made her way down. Ten Ten was surprised by this action, but was happy that he had thought to do this for her. It made her feel special and for one such as them, it was an extraordinary feeling. After breakfast and clearing the small kitchen table situated in the middle of the living room, Naruto brought out a hastily wrapped package, decorated with orange and green wrapping paper. Ten Ten squealed when she saw it and ripped the present apart to reveal a pair of ceremonial daggers decorated with a twisting emerald dragon that made its way from where the handle met the blade, to the very tip of the dagger. It was beautiful, yet simple, and the young girl's breath caught in her throat as she studied the sparkling design. You like pointy things right? I thought you would like them cause it's pointy see? Naruto scratched the back of his neck as he confessed his intention. After a heartfelt, thank you, they huddled together to plan what they would be going for the rest of the day. Well I'm definitely skipping school today. Let's do something fun. Ten Ten was literally skipping at this point. Naruto was an incredibly unique person and so whatever he came up with was bound to be exhilarating and dangerous. I've already set something up so let's go. Oh and we need to make a stop at the Higurashis before we get there okay? Ten Ten nodded enthusiastically. There was no doubt in her mind that the daggers had come from the Higurashi weapon store, and she was always excited about what new weapons came in every day. For Naruto, however, he needed something for his newest idea that he couldn't possibly find anywhere else. There wasn't likely to be a place that would have what he was looking, let alone one that wouldn't throw him out. So with that, the two youngsters readied themselves to move out. If only Ten Ten knew what Naruto had in store for the day. Entering the Higurashi weapon store, the two began to look around the aisles, Naruto for the last component of his plan and Ten Ten out of interest. The owner of the store regarded them for a moment before hailing them. Yo Naruto, and is that the Ten Ten you keep telling me about? Higurashi Naoto was a large muscular man. He was heavy set, with a square jaw and bulging biceps accentuated by his sleeveless white tank top. You could see the jet black tattoos that had been grafted onto his skin and the image gave him a very resilient look. Haya Higurashi-san, yeah this is Ten Ten. She loves all your swords and stuff. At Naruto's enthusiastic reply, the middle-aged weapon smith regarded the petite bun-haired girl with a critical eye. There were so few ninja these days who really valued weaponry, but according to Naruto, this girl had a thirst and excitement that one could only expect from a true weapons user. The feeling was usually regarded as something a samurai shared with his sword, it was definitely a rare thing to see in this modern day. Well, what did you come here for Gaki? You bought those daggers yesterday didn't you? Why didn't you just get what you needed yesterday instead of wasting another trip? At that proclamation, Ten Ten stared wide-eyed at the shopkeeper before directing her unnerving gaze to her companion. Ah, so the daggers had been for the girl. The smith grinned to himself. Young Naruto had found a friend, or so it seemed. Again, he regarded the surprised girl. If her enthusiasm was anything to go by coupled with this new piece of information he had gleaned from her reaction, she probably felt the same way as he did with regards to weaponry. However, Naoto wanted to be sure before doing something he would later regret, and so he decided to question her intentions a bit. Ten Ten was it? How did you like those daggers? said aspiring Kunoichi's head whipped round to stare at the shopkeeper once again. It was almost comical that her expression had not changed in the least since she had found out where Naruto had bought her birthday present from. Shaking herself from her reverie she replied excitedly. They were really pretty. The light shines off the dragon making it sparkle in a really mysterious way. Look, 
To drive home her point, she pulled one of the daggers from her right pants pocket with a flourish, and waved it back and forth slowly under the large man's nose. Wow, wow, slow down there miss. If you wave them around you might hurt somebody. I can see what you mean, the reflection of the light causes the green pattern to distort and it looks like the dragon is writhing on the blade. Ten Ten nodded boisterously. She didn't notice Naoto studying her again as she was too preoccupied with the blade in her hands. Naoto caught the shine in her chocolate-colored eyes as the light reflected off the blade and onto her iris. It gave the young girl's eyes an ethereal glow as the emerald mixed with the brown of her orb, glowing with the luminosity of the sun's light streaming through the windows. She had a thirst for weaponry that much the elder weapon maker was sure about and his resolve was further strengthened when he caught the expression of awe and admiration that the girl held as she ran her finger down the dragon pattern and across the edge of the blade. So great was her concentration, that she didn't even notice that the dagger had cut into her finger as she had done so, and Naoto knew that the apprentice he wanted, no, needed was right in front of him. For many years since his shinobi career had ended, he wondered how he would pass on his skills in weapon making to the next generation. He knew that his expertise was too valuable for Konoha to lose, and yet he had no family nor was he married. He had kept an eye out for a suitable apprentice and when young Naruto had first burst into his small store, he had thought a new prospective student had appeared. Of course, after spending some time with the boy, his hopes had been dashed when he found that the Jinchuriki had no interest in weapons, other than throwing them at things. Naoto was loath to treat the boy like the other villagers though. He, the Sandame and Hitaki Sakumo had been there when they had selected Namikaze Minato as the Yandaimi and the three friends knew that when the golden-haired Hokage did something, he did it to perfection. His evidence for this was during the last great shinobi war when all thought Konoha had lost. Morale was low amongst the troops and Iwa's force dominated the battlefield due to their overwhelming presence. Yet, Minato had promised that he was working on a technique to end the war. Everyone was pestering him to use it, but he had vehemently shot all of them down, stating that he would not use it until he was sure it would work. And then on that fateful day, Sakumo had resigned himself to death and had declared that the Konoha forces under his command would make a final push in an attempt to break Iwa's front line. As the brave warriors in the contingent had slammed like a battering ram into the Iwa platoon, hope blossomed in the minds of their men. The tide of battle seemed to change in that instant as the ferocity of the counteroffensive speared through vanguard of Iwa's front line. But that too had changed, and the rock's techniques on practically their home terrain shifted the battle favor once again in their direction. Naoto remembered the utter despair that had gripped his heart in its iron clutches, as he realized that the fight was lost. Konoha was lost, but then it had happened. A single scroll had been thrown high into the air from the Konoha camp and Naoto distantly recognized it as a ceiling scroll. It soared across the battlefield and every shinobi, enemy and ally alike, had gazed up at the object, the fighting temporarily forgotten. In a dramatic fashion, the scroll had unrolled itself as it was buffeted by the wind, blocking out the sun temporarily, and in a puff of smoke, Naoto spied a hail of weaponry falling to the ground around all of the combatants. Minato didn't even wait for his tri-pronged kanai to hit the ground. As soon as they were at head height, he initiated two of his techniques that in conjunction, made his legacy feared throughout the entire shinobi world and hailed him as the most devastating ninja in the history of man. Naoto could hardly comprehend that within a 30-second lull, the entire Iwa force lay decimated, bodies strewn about the battlefield. What shocked him to his core was that there was hardly any blood, yet the Iwa shinobi were most definitely dead. And then he had turned to see a sight that would be etched into his memory until the day he would die. Among the fallen bodies of Konoha's enemy, a golden flash signified the arrival of a single shinobi. His hitai eight ends and his cloak tail flapping in the wind, accentuating the flame pattern sewn into the bottom of his coat. Sunlight glinted off his golden blonde hair as it swayed to the breeze. Both his arms were pointed downward at his sides with his right arm slightly further away from his body than his left. Naoto regarded the young man in shock as the last ocean blue spirals of his legendary Rasengan faded away and he turned his head slightly to the side. And in that brief moment, the weapon specialist witnessed the sapphire sparkle of the ninja's eye as he stared at the devastation around him. After seeing Naruto, the son of the greatest ninja period, 
He had thought that maybe that same glint would carry over to his son, but as he looked at the weapons in Naoto's store, the ex-shinobi instinctively knew that it wouldn't be in weaponry. And so, with a heavy heart, he had given up ever passing on his skills, even at the Sandame's insistence that the village could not afford to lose such a thing. But now, he had found exactly what he had been looking for all these years, and he didn't intend to let it escape. 1010. How would you like to learn all about these weapons? The question came out hesitantly, but Naoto knew deep down, that it was because he was afraid of rejection. He was afraid that the only link that had appeared would disappear as fast as it came. His fears, however, were unfounded, and if it was possible, Tenten's eyes would have widened even further than they already were. She let out a small gasp, that sounded like a, what, but Naoto couldn't be sure. After a small gap in which the young girl had gone incredibly still, the shop suddenly burst into motion. Naruto, who had been searching the displays for what he was looking for, was startled at the gasp and his head snapped around so fast that the ex-shinobi almost winced and the whip-like crack that was given off. Ten Ten began jumping up and down screaming, yes, over and over again. The weapons maker's mouth twitched upwards in a small smile as he committed the scene to memory. His first apprentice was definitely one to remember. Attempting to hide his relief, Naoto briskly straightened and spoke calmly and clearly. Excellent. If you wish to learn about all things pointy, be here after the academy every day and we will continue from there. Now Uzumaki, what are you looking for? Naruto stared at the muscular man like he had said something weird. Since when did Higurashi-san call him, Uzumaki? Shrugging it off as another weird quirk of the crazy, knife man, Naruto told him what he had come for. I'm looking for a one meter length of, a grade, rubber, in the form of a rope. It was Naoto's turn to look at the other with a strange expression. A grade, rubber? The boy must know that, a grade, rubber stretches up to ten times its original length, so why would he want it? I don't currently have that high grade rubber, but I have got, a half. Maybe you would like a slightly longer piece of, a half, instead? It should do the same job though, whatever it is you want to do with it. Naoto continued to stare at the blonde-haired boy with an unreadable expression. Naruto took a minute to consider the proposal. Could it work? With, A grade, the strength of the rubber was definitely enough to withstand the kind of force he was looking to put on it. A half, would be slightly less resilient, and a longer piece meant less resilience. Ah well, won't know till I try. And with that thought, Konoha's pariah purchased his last component of the day and both kids left the shop with a smile on their faces. One smiled due to a prospective future, but the other smiled for an entirely different reason. And when Naruto smiles, something cries. Ten Ten gaped at the impossibility of what Naruto's birthday event actually was. He wanted to slingshot into the sky and then get Ten Ten to catch him. The process would then be repeated by herself and Naruto would catch her. Well, unless you're scared and you don't want to do it, then we can cancel and go do something else. Whatever you want. Ten Ten was in a quandary. It looked like it had taken a while to set up the huge contraption, and if she said no, it would be a total waste of effort on his part. No, she would do this, and god it looked like it would be crazy fun. Naruto had tied a huge trampoline horizontally to two trees at the edge of a clearing with ninja wire. The whole thing looked quite secure, but if Ten Ten hadn't found that absurd then what he did next was downright nuts. The rubber he had recently purchased had been tied to the center of the trampoline and the other end hooked to Naruto's waist. See, what we gotta do is stretch the rubber as far away from the trampoline as possible and then let go. We will be pulled back into the trampoline and it will bounce us back out again. When the rubber gets stretched fully again, we unhook it and pitch these two rubber hooks at those trees. He raised his finger and pointed at two trees that stood parallel at the other end of the clearing. Ten Ten gaped even harder. That was almost 300 meters from their current position. If that was to happen, the rubber would curl around the trees and fling them into the air. Exactly. Naruto had been watching her face to see if she had figured it out. And that's why I need you to catch me. Now cuz this is, a half, and not, a grade, rubber, I dunno if it will hold up, so I'm gonna try it first, and if it's safe then you can have a go too. Ten Ten tapped the side of her head thoughtfully. If she was truthful with herself, the idea was downright lunacy, yet there was a small thrill of excitement that went up her spine as she thought about how it would feel to experience the, ride. She had wanted a memorable first birthday after all. Alright, 
Let's do this, Ruto. Naruto stared bug-eyed at the new nickname, but ignored it as he began to stretch himself out. When the rubber was taut and he could go no further, he crouched down to stabilize himself lest he get pulled back when he wasn't ready. The tensile force was so strong that his body was shaking with the exertion of trying to stay where he was. Giving a thumbs up to the birthday girl, he released his hold on the ground and the rubber sprang back, pulling the seven-year-old along with it. As Naruto's back hit the trampoline, time slowed down for him as the plasticky surface mushroomed inwards from the impact. With a sharp, twang, he was thrown back out, and he released the hook from his waist as he shot off down the clearing towards his target. Ten Ten watched with bated breath as her friend zoomed past her position, a look of pure joy etched on his features. Just as he reached the opposite tree line, he threw the two rubber hooks at the parallel trees. They twirled three times around the branches before hooking securely to the bark. Naruto's speed immediately slowed as his direction changed drastically within a second. He had a brief feeling of vertigo as he ballooned up towards the canopy, releasing the ends to the hooks that were in his hands. With a whoop, he was fired into the air like a stone being released from a slingshot, directly up into the sky at impossible speeds. The feeling must have been incredible, as Ten Ten could hear her friend screaming in joy to the heavens as he flew. Snapping out of her thoughts, she got ready to act. Throwing two kanai, she ripped the trampoline from the tree and quickly dragged it towards the center of the clearing, where she though the blonde was going to land. Squinting at the midday sun, she could barely make out a falling blob of black. Quickly positioning the trampoline directly under the falling maniac, she hurriedly moved back to stay clear of the human projectile. Ah, once again, the blonde hit the trampoline, and for a second Ten Ten thought he would punch right through the fabric at the speed he was falling. The trampoline sprung him back out again, and this was repeated until he came to a stop. Ten Ten was in peals of laughter at the way Naruto was bouncing on the trampoline, sometimes on his head with a stupidly delirious smile on his face. It was like he had taken one of the Nidime's notorious, happy pills. Naruto wobbled to the side of the trampoline and toppled over the edge and onto the grass of the clearing. That was beyond crazy. Tears were streaming from his eyes due to the speed of his fall, his blood pounding through his body in an adrenaline-induced rush and his mouth felt like it would never be able to close again. Ahahaha. Dot hey. Oh god. That was priceless. My turn my turn. Naruto slowly raised his head from eating dirt. As his eyes made it up to her face, he grinned like a loon. You're gonna love this. And with that he sprang up to set it up again. They went at it for another few tries, and each time, none of them realized that the, a half, rubber was slowly weakening. Just as Naruto decided to have his last ride, the rubber hooks reached their limit. Naruto's first inkling that something was wrong was the slightly tearing sound he heard as the hooks pulled him up towards the sky. There was no time for him to even think as with a loud, snap. The hooks disconnected prematurely, and he was flung into the sky at an angle and not straight up like what was meant to happen. Ten Ten's shout of his name was lost to the wind as he blew through the sky towards the hot springs of the village. Hopefully he would land in one of the larger rivers in that direction, as that should relieve some of the monstrous force of his fall and he wouldn't be injured too badly. That was of course, if he didn't die. As he began his descent, he screwed his eyes shut and maneuvered his body to land forward so he could roll immediately. His descent would take him into a bush right by the side of one of the hot springs and Naruto braced for impact. The Gama Senen, Jiraiya, was having a good day. He had been in Konoha, spying on the hot springs without anyone knowing. He could be out of here without anyone knowing too, and then Serutobi Sensei wouldn't be able to pull him into anything Konoha related so he could continue his naughty ways. He absently reached up with his right sleeve to wipe the blood trailing from his nose as he gazed lecherously through his telescope at the women's side of the hot spring. No one would catch him when they couldn't see him. He was using the control, henge hybrid he had created back in his youth to hide his person and so no one could see him. Oh, they could sense his chakra, but in this village there were too many people for them to realize it was him, especially since he had reduced his chakra levels to that of a civilian. He giggled. It was useful having the skills that he had, that was for sure. Nothing could have prepared him for what happened at that instant. Jiraiya froze when he heard a slight whistling in the air, his right arm still raised in front of his nose. Quickly checking through his telescope as the whistling got louder, there had been no change in the women's side although some were staring and pointing at the sky, 
seemingly following something as it fell towards the ground. Turning to look at the sky, something hit Jiraiya with the force of a freight train. He was slammed heavily into the ground and the pavement cratered under him, as stones were thrown into the air. Jiraiya's body was literally bounced off the stone floor and thrown into the wall of the hot spring, his invisibility jutsu disengaging at the shock and pain of his predicament. He literally blew through the side of the wall and landed with an unceremonious splash in the middle of a group of women. A hush descended on the entire hot spring as the women glanced down at what had broken down the wall. Isn't that Jiraiya-sama? Catching on to the question voiced, the women began to boil in anger, putting the falling object and the arrival of the super pervert together. Jiraiya groggily raised his head from the steaming water. If he wasn't in mortal peril he would have been enjoying the sight that met his eyes. Alas, he had to move straight away. Jumping up, he ran as fast as he could out of the hole, stopping to grab the thing that had hit him, realizing that it was an unconscious boy. The kid would pay for what he did, whatever the reason was. And with that he hightailed in down the street, with the screams of the females in the hot spring ringing in his ears. Ten Ten fell over laughing for the umpteenth time that day. Naruto's story was ludicrous, only made more comical by the bandages tied around his torso and head, attempting to hide the humongous bump on his right cheekbone. He was such a character. Not only had he hit someone, but he had hit one of the Densetsu no Sanin. The world was definitely a much brighter place with Naruto around. As Ten Ten took a moment to wipe the tears of mirth streaming from her eyes, she glanced at the legendary Shinobi, who sat quietly staring at the blonde-haired patient with a stony expression. What's his problem? Ten Ten frowned at the way Jiraiya was looking at her friend. It was almost as if he knew Naruto. Your name is Uzumaki Naruto? The question came out gruff like a pencil scratching on paper. The somber expression made it seem like the powerful man was afraid of the answer he would get. Yeah, I am. How did you know? The Senin did not reply to Naruto's question. Instead he slumped forward on the stool next to Naruto's hospital bed, placing his head in his hands. For Naruto and Ten Ten, they didn't know what to make of the ninja's reaction. Naruto thought that maybe this was another person that hated him for who he was, and yet he didn't even know the reason why people hated him. For Jiraiya it was an entirely different story. He was faced with a reminder of his past, of his failings, and of his broken promises. The legacy of his student who had been mistreated and shunned by all those around him sat injured on a bed in front of him. Jiraiya couldn't bring himself to admit his failings from years ago, but raising his head he stared dully at the boy that was his godson. I'm so sorry. Naruto almost missed the whisper that escaped the old man's lips, and from her perplexed expression, Ten Ten hadn't heard it at all. For what, mister? Have we met somewhere or something? The man in red simply continued to stare at the boy. Naruto shrugged at the strange behavior displayed by his unlucky victim. He seemed to be hitting people a lot these days. First Shisui and now this guy. Ten Ten didn't have a clue what was going on between the two, but she didn't want to lose this chance to speak to such a legendary ninja. Her idol was Senju Tsunade after all, and that would make this guy her teammate. You're Jiraiya-sama, right? I've heard all about you. Ten Ten was obviously excited and her proclamation did much to lighten the suffocating mood that had permeated the air. Jiraiya didn't even glance at her, his attention fully on Naruto, and Ten Ten felt a twinge of jealousy run through her. What was so special about Naruto? Why wouldn't her idol's teammate talk to her? Silence once again settled upon the three, and for a while it remained that way. Kid, how's the academy going? Naruto looked up from the floor to regard the man once again. Cocking his head to the side, he responded bluntly. I ain't in the academy. Didn't want to go. A look of shock flitted across the Senen's face before he schooled his expression once again. How did you use your chakra in midair to slow yourself down if you didn't learn that at the academy? Naruto looked startled at the question. How had the guy known he had done that when he hadn't been looking in his direction or paying attention to anything other than his telescope? How do you know I can even do that? It isn't taught at the academy. Naruto's look was like steel now and Jiraiya was distinctly reminded of his deceased student as he was stared down by such eyes. True, they didn't teach, air pads, to anyone below Chunin, and that had definitely been a practical use of the skill. Sighing, the middle-aged shinobi responded like a teacher speaking to his student after a particularly foolish question was asked. Kid, I felt your chakra flare as you used the, air pads. 
I'm not one of the Sanin for nothing you know. Naruto looked scared for a moment. If this guy hated him, then it would get out that he knew such things. The villagers would definitely respond negatively to such a revelation and he didn't want him and tend tend to spend their lives expecting a threat at every turn. He then remembered the large man's words from a few moments before. I'm so sorry. Sandane Gigi taught me a lot of stuff when I was younger. That's how I knew the air pads. This time the shock remained on the legendary shinobi's face for a few seconds before he hastily responded. Sarutobi taught you some techniques? Jiraiya was evidently surprised at this development. Well, he didn't really teach me, just gave me a bunch of scrolls to learn how to protect myself. Jiraiya sat back on his stool. No way, just no way. The kid learned the air pads from a scroll? The last stage of control exercises before elemental manipulation, and he had learned it without going to the academy, and from a scroll. Jiraiya's mind reeled in shock as he thought about the implications of such a thing. That would make him better than his father by almost half a year, but Minato had grown up in wartime. How is it possible for someone to learn it faster without a teacher and in a time of peace no less? The kid had to be a genius. There was no the explanation. Jiraiya knew that he had to act now. He couldn't leave the boy now that he was confronted with what he had attempted to leave behind. He should never have come back to Konoha, he could have hidden from his obligations till the end of his days, but once again his stupidity led him to trouble. What would Tsunade and Orochimaru say if they could see him now? He snorted at that thought. They couldn't say anything. They were worse than he was. Tsunade with her drinking and gambling problems and Orochimaru with his twisted beliefs. He wouldn't run away from his problems anymore, unlike his wayward teammates. He would help his godson just like Serutobi sensei was helping him. He really didn't understand how very wrong he was about the boy in front of him. The door to the hospital room opened and a flustered nurse entered. Ahem. Jiraiya-sama there's a group of people outside demanding that you. Ah. Come down to die, would be the correct wording. The woman looked slightly angry herself as Jiraiya realized that the retribution for his hot spring stunt was about to bite him in the back. Glancing around, he looked for the closest avenue to escape, but with a start, he looked sideways to find the nurse's hand clamped on his shoulder preventing him from moving. I must say I agree with them on this. Jiraiya blanched. Turning his head, he capitalized on the fact that Naruto was in the room, using the tried and tested Namikaze bait. Naruto you want some ramen? My treat. And with that, the blonde bolted upright, grabbed Tenten's arm and sprinted out the door towards Ichiraku's. In the moment of chaos, the nurse had relaxed her hold and Jiraiya used the opportunity to jump out the window. As Naruto and Tenten ran towards the ramen stand, they glanced at each other briefly. Why would a whole load of women want to hurt Jiraiya? Slowly, Tenten began to catch on. You said you landed next to the hot springs right? The women sighed, right? Naruto bobbed his head in the affirmative, still confused. Ten Ten cracked her knuckles. There was a pervert to kill. Finally guys this is over if you enjoy then please like share and do comments.